Hi Church, welcome to our online worship for this week. It is great to have you worshipping with us wherever you are in the world today. Our time together will involve a time of reflection around the Lord's table, so please have something to eat and drink prepared for that part of our service. If you use a smartphone or a device, uh, you can get onto the YouVersion Bible app right now, search for Hobart City Church under events and download the, uh, the notes for the message a bit later on in the service this morning. If you didn't get a newsletter when you came in, make sure you grab one on the way out. That's all the stuff you need to know for the next couple of weeks. Church directory, it's a new year, so we're looking to update the directory. If you want to change some information that's uh, about you in the directory, there are some white forms on the information desk. Just grab one of those, make whatever alterations you want to make, uh, hand it back to me after the service or drop it into the office during the week. If you'd like a new photograph taken for the directory too, you can come and see me after the service and I'll uh, take a photograph of you. We as a church have been invited by Churches of Christ in Victoria and Tasmania to be part of their Supporting Growing Churches initiative. Um, they, they want to get alongside churches which are showing positive signs of growth and, and help them in that space. So uh, in the first week of February, uh, David Ratton, former minister of One Community Church in Blackburn, now part of conference, he's going to come down and spend some time that week with ministry team, with leaders, uh, and then on Sunday he will uh, bring the message. Uh, so just really inviting you to be in prayer for this process when, when we have the weekend with David to um, be present, be asking the right questions, uh, but particularly in the lead up to it, just be praying that God's will be done through this process as um, our state body seeks to support churches which are showing positive signs of growth. So to commence our time together, let us pray a word of blessing. Almighty God, we pray that you would bless this, our time of worship today. Lord, help us to put aside the things of the week just past and our concerns for the week ahead so that we can focus our hearts and minds upon you. Bless all those who have contributed to our time of worship today and bless those who have come today seeking for more of you, seeking to praise and honour and worship you. In the name of Jesus, we commit this service to your hands, Lord. Amen.
Good morning. There are so many terrible things happening in our world today and so much uncertainty. But as Christians, we know we have one constant which never changes. Jesus is our constant eternal in a world where there is one crisis after another. It's depressing to watch the news on TV as it's mostly sad. But the Bible tells us that there is much good news. Jesus has paid a price for us and it never changes or goes out of date. Ephesians 1 7 says, We have been bought through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. The price was the body and blood of Jesus, God's only son. God was prepared to pay the price, and so was Jesus. For God, that was the only acceptable, eternal, once for all payment for our sins. It had to be perfect. Only his perfection could reconcile us with God. That was God's plan for us and for Jesus. Jesus knew what was to happen and tried to tell his disciples at the Last Supper, but they didn't understand until he rose from the dead. So today the Father makes the offer that because of Jesus' sacrifice, we can approach the throne of grace and receive forgiveness and peace. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So as you take the wafer and the grape juice, we remember Jesus' words from 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us eat and drink together as one in Christ, as God's children saved by the blood. We pray together as a church. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this day as one people to pray for your help in the world's great time of need. Even in the darkest moments, love gives hope. Love compels us to stand together in prayer with our neighbours near and far. Love compels us to give and act as one. It is clear that we are bound together more tightly in these uncertain times as we are reminded we are in this together. As we pray in our churches and homes around the nation and around the world, we are united as one family in Christ. Let us pause and find a moment of peace and love as we lift up our hearts together in prayer. We pray for the health workers, for the scientists working on a vaccine, for our government leaders, especially for our Prime Minister, for supermarket workers, for hygiene and sanitation providers, for our police and our army, our forces, and for media outlet reporters that they will tell the truth. We say thanks be to God. We pray for those who are unwell and those concerned for loved ones, for the vulnerable, 
for the people whose income has dried up, for those who are lonely, for those who are bereaved and grieving. Dear Lord, please be their healer, comfort and protection. Be their strength, shield and provision. Be their security, safety and close companion. Let us, as a church, be aware of the pain and respond with love in action, even at a distance. We pray these things in the name of your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, welcome to the second week of the first series for 2021, the series on finding the power to change. Some of you may or may not know that before I went into ministry, I worked in the building industry uh, in South Australia, where I'm from. I began my career as an operations manager for a remote construction company. And that doesn't mean that we made things by remote control. It meant we made things and sent them to remote South Australia. Uh, yeah, it's a photograph of Armitage right up at the top of SA, just this side of the border. We made homes and schools and hospitals. We manufactured them in our factory in the Barossa, flat packed them and shipped them up to the territory to be um, assembled on site up there. After a few years of that, I headed back into the city and worked for a season as a contracts administrator um, for a building company, because I'm not handy, I don't know one end of the hammer from the other, but I know how to organise stuff. So a contract administrator basically means building lawyer. It's my job to make sure that um, the subcontractors did what they were supposed to do, when they were supposed to do it, no more, no less, and that I got paid. That was really the main part of the job. It was fun for a while, there's a few ethical fuzzy bits that I wasn't that thrilled about, but that's all part of the game of the building industry. But what I enjoyed uh, most was the feeling of accomplishment you got at the end of a project when you handed the keys over to the client. It was there in the refurbishment jobs to a certain extent, but in the jobs where you started with a vacant block of land or you demolished a structure that was already there, and then handed over to the client um, an expression of what they had imagined. It was incredible, the feeling of accomplishment. Look at what we have built together. Look at what we have grown. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking construction is not really about growth. It's building. It's different. Maybe you're right. It's not the kind of thing that naturally springs to mind when we talk about things that grow. But speaking of things that do grow, did you all see the, the picture in the press this week about the new record holder for the largest pumpkin in the Southern Hemisphere? 867 kilos of pumpkin grown in Queensland? That's a lot of soup <laughs> and a lot of scones. But for me, who is not naturally gifted at growing things or making things, being part of the construction process was, for me, about growth. Where before there was nothing, there is now something. A collection of, of lines on a page, materials brought together, was transformed into something else with a purpose. And that, that is our subject and our theme for this second week of this series. It's growth. In the first week of Finding the Power to Change, we talked about change, how it is inevitable, how it's all around us, it's what makes life, life. And it's more to do with how we approach that change that will determine how it goes for us. In God's anointed time, there is a season, turn, 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 ch -ch 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 changes will happen. It's all up to us, whether we allow that change to bring us closer to God or to move us further away. Well, today we're going to build upon that central idea and we're going to explore growth. Growth as the outcome 
of change, growing to be more like Jesus. So let us pray. Creator God, as we gather around your word today, Lord, speak to us. As we consider what it means and what it implies to grow and change, to become more like Jesus, help us to see that this is the way, that this is what you hope to see in your children. May the insight from you, Lord God, that, uh, that comes from you today be the thing that shapes us and changes us, and the things that are just from me be forgotten. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you or your devices open, we are in the New Testament this week. We are in Paul's letter to the church in Rome and we're reading the first 14 verses of chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is true worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is in giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So in our context and for the purposes of this series, growth is the natural outcome of change. And the first thing we need to know about growth, which as it happens grows nicely from where we were last week, is that as Change is inevitable, so is growth, but we have a choice to make about how we grow. Growth is what makes us human. From the moment of conception, we are on a growth trajectory, on our way to fulfil, given the right conditions, our growth allocation as encoded in our DNA. For most part, of the, the growth that happens is beyond our control. We are just along for the ride waiting to see just how tall we will be. But there comes a moment in life when we are presented with some growth options. Do we hit the gym and grow some muscle? Or do we hit the couch and grow in other ways? Psychologists argue that the human brain makes us generally cautious about change and growth. They say that our primary mode of approaching life, and this is partially how we are wired, partially result of our modern culture, is that we will seek, where possible, to avoid pain and find pleasure. It's simple. If it feels right, then eat it, take it or do it. If it feels wrong, then spit it out, get rid of it or avoid it. However, with this mindset, with this worldview, this leads to stunted growth and unreached potential. The old adage says, no pain, no gain. And while this is certainly true, if we start choosing the gym over the couch, start choosing the salad over the hamburger, it's also true when we open up our lives to God's leading, to Christ's influence and to the Spirit's shaping. Growth is a choice. 
Paul says that if you have chosen God, if you are wearing the name of Jesus, then growth is just the logical step. He writes in verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And so our reading begins with the classic Pauline opening, therefore, which we, as they say in college, you ask the question, what is it there for? It's there because Paul wants to make a point. He says, given everything that I've just written to you about, the previous 11 chapters, because of all of that, this is what I expect of you in this next statement. Paul has spent the first 11 chapters, and this is to summarise Romans really, really simply, but he has been basically saying, God is compassionate. God is merciful. Therefore, he says, make the right choice. Do the right thing. So Paul urges. He doesn't command, he doesn't dictate, he doesn't tweet at us in all caps. This is is about free will. He says, if you fully understand the grace that you have received, then these Christ-like ethics which I'm about to lay out for you will be a matter of you expressing your gratitude. This is not an expectation. I urge you, says Paul, choose growth. And what does this growth look like according to Paul? He says, present yourself, everything you have to God as a living sacrifice. This is how Paul describes growth. Jesus would have said, be ready to die to yourself. Stop trying to be God and let God be God. Paul uses the language of sacrifice because it would have made sense to the people who may have come from a Jewish background who are reading this, but for anyone in the Roman Empire, they would have understood what he meant. Sacrifice was still part of their culture. When you sacrifice something, you weren't half in. You didn't just sacrifice a bit of an animal. It was all or it was nothing. This is what Paul is getting at. Following Jesus is not just something you do half-hearted, you don't do it as a hobby, it's not something you do in your spare time. Following Jesus is everything. Following Jesus is life. Following Jesus is growth. And to Paul, because of God's great compassion, he sees this response as your true and proper worship. It's time to get our Greek on this morning. The Greek word is logikos. Say logikos. It's where we get our modern word logical from. It means rational. It means genuine. What Paul is saying is this should be your true, your rational, your genuine, your logical response. As Spock would say, it's only logical. Growth is the logical choice, says Paul. It shouldn't be a hard one. When you accept Jesus, accept growth. But don't expect instantaneous results. Growth in Christ is not like my instant lawn at home. It didn't happen in 10 minutes. Christian growth doesn't happen instantaneously. There is no such thing as microwave spirituality. It takes time. Given the choice between fast food and a home-cooked meal, most people will choose the home-cooked meal, except for my kids. (laughs) Fast food is made quick to eat quickly and to temporarily fill your stomach. But it's highly processed, it's relatively unhealthy, and it's expensive. 
On the other hand, a home-cooked or a restaurant-cooked meal made in the oven or in the slow cooker, given the time to marinate and absorb all the flavours. Yes, it, it takes longer, it takes more effort, there may be more frustration involved and certainly makes for a messier kitchen, but in the end, it's worth it. And it's usually better for you. Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing and perfect will. Now the word transformed is the key in this verse. In the Greek, it is metamorpho. Say metamorpho. where we get the modern word metamorphosis from. The technical definition is to be or become changed in outward appearance or expression as manifesting a change in nature or essence. It means changing who you are. Not just a little change in the inside, but so that inside change can be seen. It's the same word that was used to describe the transfiguration of Jesus on that mountain where he shone with the glory of the heavens. For us, it means that lifelong process of change and growth into Christ-likeness. However, we need to remember that this change is only a result of what Paul has just said. It only comes after we have given up control to God, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, putting God in the driver's seat 24-7 and allowing Him to transform us. There has developed over the last decade or so this new vocation called a personal trainer. Anyone here a personal trainer? Okay. It seems to be, to me, a logical career path for those who really loved physical fitness classes at high school. I loathed physical fitness classes at high school. I loved PE, where we learned about sport and play sport, but physical ed, that was like 20 minutes a day, four days a week, it required a complete change in uniform and across five years of school, it was hours and hours of torture, humiliation and abuse. Anyway, enough therapy from me. These days, there are these people called personal trainers and basically what they are is that if you have a personal fitness goal that you don't think that you can achieve on your own, You pay someone money and then you give them control of you for a couple of hours a day or a week, depending on how serious you are, and they will help transform you and grow you towards the goals that you have and hopefully treat you a little bit nicer than your physical fitness teacher at high school. But what I'm getting at is Christian growth is not instantaneous. It requires effort, it requires time. Perhaps you like to think about it as like one of those training montages in the movies. Think of your favourite sporting movie or your favourite action-adventure movie and there will be in there somewhere the training montage. The, The hero, the protagonist of the story will figure out that they have this goal, this thing they have to achieve and know that right now, They're not going to be able to achieve that, so they need to give themselves as a living sacrifice to put their time and effort to get themselves to that point where they can achieve that goal. It's become almost a standard Hollywood trope these days. And there have been some great training montages in the movies. Who can forget the Karate Kid? Wax on, wax off. Empire Strikes Back, do or do not, there is no try. Batman begins, all you need is the will to act. Or the ultimate of training montages, the one that set the bar that everyone tries to achieve, the one from Rocky.
You're gonna kill him! No special effects, no stunt doubles. That's all Sylvester Stallone at his peak. But unlike a personal trainer, unlike Mickey, Rocky's boxing coach there, God doesn't want something from us. He doesn't want our time, our money or our sweat. God wants us. God wants us to choose him to present ourselves willingly as living sacrifices, ready to die to ourselves, to give up control of our lives to God so that God can then spend the rest of our lives transforming us into the likeness of His Son, Jesus. Because growth has a shape. Remember last week when I told you that fictitious bird story? Well, in the tradition of animal stories which aren't true, I have another one for you. Probably also came to me once in a PowerPoint presentation. But there is an urban legend which says that sharks will only grow to the size that the aquarium allows. The shark, when kept in captivity, will only ever be in proportion to the confines of its environment. So the story says that you could have a fully matured shark, which is only six inches long, if you kept him in your aquarium at home. But you put him back in the ocean and he'll quickly grow to his regular length of two to three metres. And the story goes and says that the same is true for us, that we will never, if we never step beyond our immediate environment, we will never grow to our full potential. The problem with that story is that real sharks, not the freshwater fish that we call sharks, which aren't really sharks, are notoriously hard to keep in captivity. Those that are captured small die due to water quality issues as they grow, rather than dying because of the size of the tank that they are in. But the truth is that things do grow to reflect their maker. A shark will grow to reflect its parent. If you plant a peach stone in the ground, you're only ever going to get a peach tree. I'm told I look look more like my mother than my father. She doesn't have a beard though. But there are elements of both parents in me. And as we grow in our Christian faith, we are to grow into Christ-likeness. And we call this process of growth and change a big, fancy, churchy word called sanctification. Not the sort of word you use during the rest of the week. But sanctification comes from the verb to sanctify. It means to separate or to set apart. In the Bible, sanctification generally relates to an act of God whereby he sets apart a person, a place or a thing so that his purposes may be accomplished. At the very moment that we are saved in Christ, we are also sanctified and we begin the process of being transformed, of being grown into the image of Christ. Now, Paul doesn't use the word sanctification in this letter to the church in Rome, but he does describe its outward appearance in verses 9 through 14. He's argued that that growth is a logical choice, that when we give ourselves over to God 100% and we allow the Holy Spirit then to guide us and shape us and mould us away from conforming to the world, but being transformed into Christ's likeness. And when that happens, we'll be able to discern God's good will and know what is good and acceptable and perfect. And when that happens, it will look like this. Love must be sincere. We will hate what is evil and cling to what is good. 
Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Sanctification is the lifelong growth of the believer with all the complexities and the messinesses that that will entail. For contemporary Christianity though, easy answers seems to be the preferred way. Go to a Christian bookshop and you'll see six steps to this, ten steps to that, forty days to this. We want to break it down and make it simple as possible. But sanctification is not easy. It relies on trust, on community and on the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit as it renews and transforms believers from the inside out. Now we may look at those Christ-like attitudes up there on the screen, those things of Jesus that should be reflected in us and think, well, I don't measure up to that. God can never change me to be like that. I'm too set in my ways, I'm too stubborn, I'm too grumpy, I'm too much in control. Well, let me reassure you, as you bring this to a close, in two ways. Firstly, the the first truth sometimes can take a whole lifetime to discover, but it's this. Sanctification is not about getting us to become something we're not. Sanctification is about growing us into more of what we already are. In Christ. You see, when we first recognize who Jesus is, when we first call out his name and are saved, our identity changes. We become a child of God. We become a Christian and we begin the journey. Now, the word Christian, the word that we use to describe ourselves, means simply little Christs. And that's who we are on the journey to become more Christ-like. But when we are saved, we take on that identity. So it's about becoming more of what we already are and not changing who we are. And the second thing is that sanctification is not something that we do in our own strength. We can montage ourselves like Rocky as much as we want, but sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit who is at work sanctifying the believer. This is not about behaviour management, but about the transformation of us at the core. Instead of changing only our behaviours, God changes our thoughts, our emotions and our habits. But like change in its purest sanctification, growth into Christ-likeness is a choice that we have to make. We have to be willing to die to ourselves, to give ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, to embrace the Spirit's transformational ability to make us more like Jesus. Or we will cling to our sinful desires and be conformed to the world around us. The Christian life is about change and growth to reflect more of Jesus through this process we call sanctification. Changed by God from the inside out. So the question I want to leave you with for the second week of our series is this. Into whose shape will we grow? The shape of Jesus or the world? Let's pray. Father, thank you that the process of sanctification is not done in our own strength, but that you are the one that brings about holiness and change in our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your faithfulness in promising and delivering your Spirit and help us to continually invite his power into our lives, seeking to be transformed little Christians and not conformed by the world around us. 
Lord, if we have yet to give ourselves up 100% to you as living sacrifice, help us to let go of that control and to seek more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us and sing our last song this morning. to worship today. I hope that God has spoken to you in a meaningful way. Please come next week where the theme is procrastination. So should I get around to it, we'll have a message for next Sunday. If not, we'll watch a video or something. But that's next Sunday, the week three of this Finding the Power to Change series. Uh, parents, if you've checked your kids into kids' church, please head downstairs and grab them before you head home. But uh, please enjoy the sunshine. It looks like a beautiful day outside. Remember, if you want to uh, update, change, or be included in the directory information on the information desk, or come and see me. I'm happy to photograph you after the service. But as we move from this space into whatever God has for us today, let's remember that wherever we go, we wear the name of Jesus. Let's wear his name carefully, for we are not our own. Let's wear his name gratefully, so we're bought with a great price. 
Let's wear his name joyfully because our names are written in heaven. And by the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon those of us here, those who we love and those whom no one loves this day and every day we have left to live. Well without end. Amen.